There you go. You're live on air. Hello. Imogene, it's lovely to see you. So where are you in the world? What are you doing? I'm in London. I live in Walthamstow now and I'm a photographer's agent. What kicked this off? We were chatting and you said something to me. You said, again, like everybody that seems to have graduated and done so super well, just reminds me of something I did wrong. Back when we were <laughs> learning together as you were. And, and yeah, you said to me, you said, you said, I wish by the second year, I knew I didn't want to be a photographer. I wish someone had come and told me how fun photography could be, even if you were not a photographer. That broke me. So thanks <laughs> for that. <laughs> let's, let's come back to that in a minute. But what was your journey into photography? I was always quite creative as a child. Like I really liked art and painting, but I was never very good at it. So when I was able to pick up a camera, my dad was into photography. That kind of just sparks an interest. I studied photography at A-level and did really well and decided that that's what I wanted to do at uni. So I went to Coventry Uni to study photography. I chose photography. I chose Coventry um, because they had a very colourful prospectus and they also had a, the opportunity to do a study year abroad. Um, and travel was something that I'd always been quite passionate about. Um, it's like growing up, I'd done a gap year between, I wanted to do a gap year between school and university. And a lot of the paths into uni, they made you do a, or what's it when you have to do all of the different? Foundation. Uh, you had to do a foundation course. But at A-level, I'd done art, graphics and photography. So I felt like I'd already done that. And I knew I wanted to do photography and not waste another year in education. So... I went to Coventry and I loved uni life there. But you didn't want to be a photographer. What was that like? I, I asked this, right, because last year I had a student who was beside herself because one of the things that she had to do for the module was to create an online portfolio. And she said, I can't do that honestly. I can't pretend that I'm going to be a photographer because I'm not. This horrified me, knowing that you, you'd gone through this as well. And so I said, what is it you want to be? And she said, I want to be a curator. And I said, your online portfolio and your research should reflect that. This should be a platform. Tell us your story. Always loved taking pictures, but I wasn't very good. Like I was very, like, I did everything very last minute. And in second year, we had some modules that I could really get my teeth into. And it was very research-based. And I was researching ideas for projects, but then I couldn't put my vision for a photograph into an actual image that I knew what I wanted it to look like and I knew where I should be like going to get that picture but my final output was never as good as I wanted it to be and I really enjoyed the research part and one of our modules was to gain some work experience I think we had just about 30 something days and I reached out to a photographer called Jennifer Patterson who that year had come second in the Taylor Wessing Portrait Prize because just to ask her if she needed someone to come and work with her once a week to help her research her projects. I liked the work that she was doing at the time. And so, yeah, I, from Coventry once a week, I commuted down to London. I was lucky to, like, I stayed with my cousin the night before and then went to work with Jennifer in East London for the day and then came back to Coventry for my um, modules the next day. And we'd just sit at, sit in her studio house, like research project, be on the laptop, talking about ideas that she had for shoots and how she wanted it, how, how she wanted those to look. If she was doing a shoot, I'd be there with the reflector. I'd, she, she shot on film, so I'd be like loading the film, giving her the camera back and we'd be swapping it out. And I really liked doing that. So I did think about assisting for a little bit, but. Again, it, I wanted to do more research and um, basically I asked, I was talking to her about her career into how she got into being a photographer and she said that she'd started as an agent and then gave me some agencies that she liked the work of and I did some research into that. So I thought actually this is something I can do. Being an agent is working with photographers and photography. You're researching brands and clients that they could be working for you're then finding the contact and reaching out. And if the shoot comes about, then you end up producing the shoot. So, yeah, we need to go a bit more granular. But it's back to that, I, I, did, I didn't know that you, I didn't recall that, you, that you'd done that while you were there. That is amazing. But that's just reaching out. 
So that's pretty scary for a lot of people. Can you remember what you, how you did it? Yeah, I think as I always say this now as well, it's very, just be honest and your authentic self. I generally liked her work. So I just it, it sent an email and just gave a little introduction as to who I was, what I was doing and, and what I needed. Um, hi, I'm Imogen. I'm a, I'm a second year student at Coventry University. We've got a module where we need to do some professional experience. I saw your work in the Taylor Wessing and I really loved X, Y, Z about it. Um, let me know if you need an extra pair of hands or would be interested in meeting for a coffee. And she responded to say yes. Amazingly simple. Good luck. Yeah. Beautiful. It is, it's like, it can become quite monotonous if you're not getting replies, but yeah, I just always keep an email simple what you want, what you like, yeah, what you want and why, and just, yeah, be kind. That's really valuable communication sort of advice. Just keep it simple, as you say, yeah, that we're really practical as well. And it's something that we can implement. So thank you for being so generous with that. So you've done your work experience, you are graduating, you're very self-deprecating, you work super hard at the university and you work with photography. A major project. I loved making my book. And I loved the research into making my book and the one print that I put in the exhibition. I, I, I did generally love that project, but I knew I was never going to make money doing that. And unfortunately, life is not free. <laughs> Let's get to money in a bit. That's because that brings a really important subject. So, so what was the first thing you did after graduating or did you even, you, obviously you started your second year, but what were you doing then? Were you still keeping these contacts? On the cellar or yeah, so step? I'd I'd been working with Jennifer for a second during my second year, and even past the module, we continued working together. In my third year, I actually went away and I went to Madrid and studied there for a year, which for me was really good because in the second year, I'd been really apprehensive about what my final major project was going to be. I knew it had to be a big body of work, but I had no idea what was going to inspire me and keep me interested for that long. And I actually can't remember how I came, like how I learned about it, but somehow I was introduced to Savile Row and the tailors on Savile Row. And so in my, decided right at the end of the second year that actually that was going to be what I wanted to do. While I was in Madrid, I studied different subjects that weren't necessarily art related but I, oh, I have my camera out there and I did try and find tailors in Spain that would allow me to go in and photograph and it was a bit tricky with the language barrier but it was my first kind of insight into like a tailors and what's inside like downstairs in the basement where they make the suits but it really informed kind of how I'd start that project when I got to third year. And, and so I'm thinking now you're moving out of education. You just said life's not free. So what was the first thing you did? Where did you go after it, after university? Uh, so after uni, I moved back to Surrey and I was quite fortunate that it's, it is only an hour commute between like Dorking and uh, London. And I just, I knew I wanted to be an agent, I had a list of, there's a, I think I Googled London agents and there's a list called the agents list and I went through each website, looked at photo making sure they represented pho photographers that were whose work I liked, seeing if they were offering internships on the website, and then just dropping them an email and saying who I was, what I was looking for, did they have any opportunities, or would they be able to meet for a coffee just to offer some advice? And I must I sent lots and lots of emails and didn't get a whole load of replies. Apart from, they got a reply from Adele, who was at Shoot, which isn't actually an agency anymore. But I must have been, I graduated in July. I was emailing her in August and I started a three month unpaid internship in September. Uh, there's a lot, there's a lot there. Yeah. So the, the first thing is that you, I, it's, I, it's so valuable that people just dismiss it or think it's enough simply just to send out a hundred emails. Whereas doing the research that you just described, 
are they representing photographers that I like? When you said you reached out to the, the second place Taylor Wessing winner, and you said, I liked these things about your work. I hear, I hear that. If someone would approach me, then I love photography versus I really like that image you made, the one of X, Y, yeah. or Z. And it's, oh, you really did know. I, I think yeah, it I, shows that you care. And it sounds so silly showing that you care in like a working environment, but people want to know why you're interested. Like if a, if a photographer reaches out to me to be represented, like I want them to have looked on the website and go, well, I really like this project that you worked on with this photographer and my work is like this. And I think it would really suit, it would fit within the roster. And if I reach out to a photographer that I'd like to represent, I'm not like, hi, I'd love to represent you. It's, hi, I'm a big fan of your work. I really liked this project you did. Would you be open to having a conversation? It's not, I think when you're, what's the word? Like kind and like a gentler approach maybe, but just an authentic approach. I think you're, as, a, as an agent, you'll never represent a photographer well whose work you don't like. And even if you're like, oh, they'll make loads of money. But you won't like it. Won't work if you don't like their work. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I feel like I'm rambling. Me, not at all. It, it, I come back again and again to to to, a, to somebody else to another graduate I interviewed, and I asked him, a, uh, which I'll ask you at the end. I said, what, what advice would you give yourself? And he said, don't look for a job. He said, look for something you want to be a part of. And I'm thinking, you know, a job representing a photographer or a photographer you love, though, whose work you love, that you really feel and you empathise with. And, no, it makes complete sense to me, and, but it's, you know, I'm, I, I wish I'd been saying it. If you reminded me of things I'm, that I'm not saying, so I should have said it, but you said it anyway, so I don't have to say it now, so that's great. So I think we need to get down dirty with what, what an agent actually does now, because I, you'd listed out on your, I took the liberty of going onto your LinkedIn page, Imogen, and the first time you log your work, your job experience, as one does, you list out the things you did, your skill, you said, no, Research just keeps coming up again and again, but I think academic research is, there will be people in the room who are recoiling at you saying research. So I think you should just need to say what the, the, the many forms that takes, but you say it's uh, more my role will include lots of things like seeking out new opportunities for photographers we represent, one, suggesting different brands that they would work well with, two, approaching advertising agencies who represent those brands, three. So that's the first one. There's more, right? So those simple steps, one after the other, and that practical next step to implement something is fascinating. And then you say researching artist portfolios and meeting with advertising agencies to promote our photographers and form relationships. Just give us a, so, some practical things that we can point at, examples of, of what, where you do that. So if I'll work with a photographer and generally when I'm working with a photographer, I'll say, who do you want to shoot for? I'll look at their portfolio and they have a good idea of where they want their career to go. So we discuss that and whether they say it's an ad agent or whether they say a big ad campaign, Virgin Atlantic, or they might say something like Zalando or Hunter Boots, or I'd really like to work with drinks brands. So you then you look at their portfolio and you say, okay, maybe it's not quite right for a drinks brand at the moment because we don't have any reference of drinks in here. But so let's do a test shoot that features a bottle or a glass with a, a drink in it and build on that so that when you then approach the brand, you've got something to say, well, yes, they can shoot drinks. And then you know, hopefully they'll employ you down the line. Yeah, and a test shoot. It's used for test shoot. So uh, unpack a test shoot from all, all the things that go into that. A test shoot is an idea that you use to like fill a gap in your portfolio. So if you wanted to shoot for a drinks brand, but you've never, you've shot like lifestyle people on holiday by the beach, but you've never actually shot, photographed someone with a bottle in your, their hand. And it sounds crazy that a lot of commissioners like to know that you can shoot someone holding a drink. Sounds crazy. So you do that, you do it in the same way that you would maybe do a main campaign, but obviously you do it a lot cheaper and a lot more, like much more basic. So you might be able to, you'll try and get models who are also trying to fill their portfolio and show that they can hold a bottle and that they can 
interact with a drink without it and it look natural. You might want to work with a stylist who wants to get some more campaign work in their portfolio. So they might have some clothing items that they've had left over from other shoots that they can pull in. Again, makeup artists that want to show that they can shoot more commercially and you need to show that you can light or maybe you'll use like natural light, but you're basically putting the shoot together to show and prove that you can do it on a grand scale, but on a paired back set scale. Yeah, that's, you're just describing a hugely collaborative process. 100%. Like photography as a career is a, is a collaboration. Even as a, a photographer, you're working with your assistants. They're, put, they're helping you create your lighting setup. You're, as you're photographing, they're backing up your images and using Capture One to sort all your files out. Um, they can put, they're putting grades on while the client's looking at their screen and you're shooting. So all you need to focus on is getting the right angle shot emotion from the pictures and everyone else around you is helping make that happen. And so you, so that I, I you described the operation and all the operational elements, but the, at the beginning you said, who do you want to shoot for? And you gave an example, a couple of examples, and then you said, here's a drink. Do you want to shoot more with a drinks campaign? So what's, how would you develop the idea for the shoot? How would that happen? How would it, is, is that an important part of it? And are you looking for photographers that have their own sort of vision or are you looking for photographers who can in, uh, implement somebody else's vision? And when you think about the brand, how would you think about telling this, understanding the story of the brand? What goes on there? So if I was with the photographer that I'm representing, they'll have a, a body of work that we already think sits within like the drinks brand world. They just might have to bring in some tests to bulk up that portfolio just to show evidence that they can do it. We would then go to the brand or the ad agency that represents the brand and I'll take the portfolios in and I'll be talking to like art producers and art buyers about the photographer, showing their portfolio, talking about how they work, how they light, how they are on set, like personally. And then hopefully when the agency and the brand have the right brief, they'll get in touch with the photographer. Um, they might have a, a basis for an idea, but they'll then want the photographer to add to that. Like a lot of the pitching work that we do now for ad campaigns, the agency will always put three photographers forward score to the client. So we might be pitching with one photographer and there's two other photographers agents pitching with their photographers to the ad agency, which will then be put to the client. And that's when we put a treatment deck together. And that's when we'll start with the art direction from the creative. They'll have said what they want to shoot and their idea for the shoot. And then our photographer will have the opportunity to talk about who they'd like to cast, how they'd like to style how they'd like the shot, how they'd liked the shots, how, yeah, what angles they'd like to use, what perspective. They'll put all of that into a document, which will then go to the ad agency who will then pitch to the client. So that is the treatment deck then? Is it? That's the treatment deck. And, and so you just describe this and how they would like to, are you actually, are they actually, is this the test shoot then that there will be? No, so the test oh. shoots. Already gone. Already gone. So I think. It's such like a long, it's a very long process. I think at the moment, actually, this is probably a good example. So I've just started a new agency and they've taken on a photographer called Adam and he does a lot of luxury, like luxury fashion, uh, accessories, but also he's been shooting cars as part of editorials. And we put, Matt put together a newsletter, which just has his own car work on it so it stepped away from the people it was just cars and we send that newsletter out adam castle car photographer um because that's something that adam would really like to do and we got a brief in this week for a car brand so now because adam's been building on cars in his portfolio for the last however many years. He's been shooting cars as part of editorials or personal projects. We've curated his portfolio to be car focused, 
sent the newsletter out to ad agencies who represent car brands. And we'd had a brief come in from one of those ad agencies requesting Adam's one availability and if he'd be interested. And then at which point we'll then start the treatment deck. Amazing. That's, uh, that's amazing. Yeah, that, that must be so exciting to be able to see that whole process and then to, to land the job. Yeah. I mean, so I've been at my job for three weeks, but when the email came through to the managing director, he was over the moon. He was like, it's work. <laughs> Now, yeah, I love it when the plan comes together and all that. But but uh, just going to go back, because you said, when you said you were talking to the ad agencies, you said the photographer's vision, the way they shoot, the way they are on set. That was quite interesting. You are really, you're selling a person, but you're also selling sort of a, a brand, really, aren't you? And and this sort of, I, I identify this brand as being now a, a, car, photo, a, car, a car photographer. You, he's, you're really differentiating him from his the other work, right? So that's, yeah. is that, so that's really important, is it? That you're really discernible as being about this thing, rather than everything. Yeah, hundred percent. No photographer can shoot everything. If someone comes to me and says, there's still a life photographer, a car photographer, a portrait photographer, a lifestyle photographer, you may, maybe you are, but you're probably not doing all of those things brilliantly. That a photographer needs to know, have a very specific style and yeah a, a, a style in their work like maybe it's really abstract still life and maybe that does move into some that textures or maybe it can sometimes move into lifestyle but yeah if there's a photographer you're either great with people or great with products or animals you can be like an animal photographer but you can't I don't it's very rare to see someone who's good at everything it make that makes sense. And do you have, do you often you must have seen a lot of photographers' folios now. Do you ever reach a point where you say, you know what, actually you're really good at this, and you should do this? Yeah. Does that surprise? Yeah, that happens. And are they surprised? I've noticed that consistently that we are the worst, our own worst editors. That you really need to find someone you trust and believe them when they say that this image over here, this was really working, and that one you laboured over and you did really want the world to see, isn't actually good enough. <laughs> It's, yes, 100%. Photographers can be terrible editors of their own work. But also, it, that will really affect that how they felt on the day, like how they interacted with the model, if the light was right, if they actually were able to get their vision in the picture. So sometimes it takes one person removed who worked on the project as well to say, actually, this is a great key image. We really the lighting here. And they might be like, oh, I don't like it because I don't like the T-shirt. Like, you can fix how the T-shirt hangs or well, that doesn't matter because actually the T-shirt's not the main part of the image. The main part of the image is the car. We, I, did, I have had that quite recently where we, I really fought to be able to put a picture on Instagram because it felt really cinematic, but the photographer really didn't like the image just because of their experience on the day. Amazing. Amazing. We should, we should actually look at some, we should talk about some stuff we can point at. Yeah. So last year we, last year we pitched and won a job for Virgin Atlantic with a photographer called Kate Bones. We worked with a production company. They handled the bulk of the production that as an agent, I was working on the treatment and just helping the external producers produce the shoot. So this was a campaign that we shot last year and it was out of home, which meant it went on the tube and on billboards around London. And I think the whole of the UK actually, and it also went out to America. So that, that campaign came out last November and basically the photographer on that joined the, the uh, roster four years beforehand. Um, at the time, she'd purely been shooting GIFs um, and during the four years that I worked with her, we worked on her portfolio to add stills to her portfolio as well as moving image. And she did that through testing. So she hired a studio, worked with a makeup artist, did some test shoots of just stills, not GIFs. She also built on her GIF ability when she first started we were only shooting them on film but she then developed that practice to be able to shoot them digitally which meant that ad agencies and uh, brands were able to use them able to see 
how the shoot was going on set and we were able to animate on set so you could get a idea of what the output would look like and yeah so with the photographer for four years we built her stills portfolio we built her ability to make her did her film gifts digital we took her portfolio into ad agencies production companies including the production company that worked with us on this campaign so for this campaign, the ad agency with the client had decided that they wanted, they wanted to make quite a dynamic campaign that caught your eye. They didn't want just a still image and they wanted some motion. And so they decided they wanted to follow the GIF route. Um, and the photographer that I was working with, she was very known for her GIFs, but still we had to pitch against other photographers. So our treatment, which I don't have to show, talked about her experience, why she is the queen of gifts, how she's developed her practice from film to digital, how we'd shoot on a digital rig, how she'd light it on set, how um, we'd use an assistant who could animate the gifts on set so that the client would be able to see an example of what the final campaign would look like. And then that treatment eventually won us the job. So we then were working with um, a production company called Twin Production, who um, they managed the bulk of the shoot. And um, I was the person between the photographer and the producer, making sure that everyone got what they needed. I've got the deck. So this is something that we'd go through before before the shoot. This was it's like a PPM document. Sorry, PPM. Yeah, pre-production meeting. Gotcha. So you'll have, we have several of these in the lead up. Basically, once the ideas signed off and the photographer signed off, production begins and you start, who's going to, who are you casting? What are they wearing? Where are we shooting? And how is it going to be lit? So oh, these were the original drawings from the client. And this save for every drop is the uh, image I just showed you. So first... We knew we were shooting on a plane. The campaign was about all of the, the things that you get when you fly with Virgin Atlantic. So you get an ice cream, you get a kid's pack, you get high tea, you get salt and pepper shakers that are the shape of uh, airplanes. In certain classes, you, there's an option to do wine tasting, the movies that you get to watch on, on the flight. So it was all about, yeah, these in-flight perks that you get when you fly with Virgin Atlantic. Which meant that we needed to shoot on a plane, but to shoot on a plane is extremely difficult because it's very tight, compact. There's not really any space to put your lights, let alone a digital rig, which is four cameras rigged together to fire at the same time. The production company reached out to some set designers who designed a plane to mimic a Virgin Atlantic plane, and that goes from the seats. We hired seats specifically from prop houses. There was a lot of discussion into what angle the cameras were going to be, how many rows of seats we needed to have. Is this going to reflect business class, premium economy or economy? How we'd create the lighting from the plane in the set build plane? And what's outside a plane window when it's in a studio? How do you recreate the sky? Um, how do you recreate the, the gradient of the sky? Um, it turns out, well, when uh, planes have different lighting depending on the time of day, so long haul flights, they'll have a twilight light that is like mimics twilight. They'll have a nighttime light. They'll have a morning light. And each of those products that you get during your journey, they kind of coincide with a certain point of the flight. So you get your welcome drink, you get your kids pack, you get your afternoon tea, you can do your wine tasting, but these things happen at you know, certain times during the flight. So the light of the plane changes during that, as does the light outside the window. Yeah, we learned quite a lot on shoot. So we ended up shooting in this studio, Alba West, big studio, and in the, that white cove is where we had the the set build, we also had, obviously, we had a big blue colorama, but then there were lights there creating like the pinks and the, the yellows to uh, simulate different times of day. And then it has a very nice client area as well. So this was this scamp that was drawn for us originally. 
And so within this, you need to look at casting. Also had a, a Virgin Atlantic flight attendant attend the shoot so that we could have that um, authentic Virgin Atlantic uniform within the shot. And um, we would talk hair, we talk makeup, wardrobe, nails, um, props for the glass, but that has to be uh, in keeping with the actual glass that you'd get on a Virgin Atlantic flight. And um, we had a big discussion about another shot because the scamp was popcorn, but they weren't sure if there was actually going to be popcorn available on the flights for the next six months to a year. They were, I think they changed them to biscuits, but biscuits didn't work well with the story. Oh no, it changed to crisps. That was it. So we had this, the scamp started as popcorn, but we changed it to crisps because you can't advertise something that's not there. So if we'd shot popcorn and Virgin Atlantic wouldn't have been able to use those images because they don't actually supply popcorn or a flight. So this was the kind of, this was the brief. The scenario is an adult female playfully, playfully slip, sipping wine as part of the onboard wine tasting experience. And this was the, then we had a casting brief, where in the plane you'd be sat if you had this experience. And then some references to the type of woman that we'd want to be cast, cast in. Um, so the next slide is, we would have put this brief out to casting agents who would then have got in touch with model agencies who would have put people forwards. And then from probably a short list of 20 plus women, we got down to two. Um, and then we were talking about wardrobe and like what we'd like her to wear. A more wardrobe style. Um, then talk about the what gets approved. So we'd work with a wardrobe stylist who'd go out, they'd pull items, they'd put looks together, and we'd probably have a styling day where the talent comes along, gets what well, the model comes along, and they dress them and how you want them to different looks. So that on that day you know that they're either wearing look one, look two, or look three rather than having to go through hundreds of items. It really streamlines a shoot day. Props, they wanted, did they want a beret? Did they want her to wear jewelry? Everything on a, before you go to set, all of these decisions are made. So there's room obviously on the day to change your mind, but every element of the shoot is spoken about in advance. So this is incredibly, and yeah, this sort of production line is is incredible. You're unpacking for us. And who is responsible? Is this your job? Are you responsible for... So this, this? for this one, we worked with a production company because it was such a big scale. Obviously, as a photographer agent, my role is to produce shoots, but also market the photographers. And if I had produced this shoot, then my entire time would have been taken up with this production. Um this production company we work with also works with the client. So the job came through them. They, the agency had seen our work before. The production company who art by had seen our work before. And so it, it came that way. Okay. Gotcha. And this was talking about different glasses to have on the set. And then the lighting treatment. So then this is what the photographer wrote about how they'd light the shoot and an example that they'd done before. Um, this was more talk about lighting on the actual plane itself so that it had the, it, it looked authentic and how we could work with these strip lights, but also the photo lights. An example of how the plane should be lit. And that's my last slide. So that's amazing. And so this lighting stuff, have you got specialists, lighting assistants? Have you got at least people who might work in the film industry as well, or are they specific to photography? More specific to photography, because in film, it's, everyone has a very specific role, like you just light. Whereas in photography, there's a, it's a bit more fluid. So a photographer will have their digiop, who is who manages the digital output. So cameras tethered to capture one as the pictures are coming in, the digi is naming the files, filing them away into 
folders, shot one, look one, shot one, look two, so that later when we're going through to make selects or the client's there to make selects, they can do it very easily. Then they'll have their first lighting assistant who, I guess, they work with the most regularly. They, the lighting assistant will know how the photographer likes to shoot, whether they actually use flash, constant lighting, and which works for their camera the best. The lighting assistant, there'll be a first lighting assistant, a second lighting assistant. And on this campaign, we actually had a third and fourth because it was such a big, a big setup. And that just means that whole team are able to jump in, move a light, lift a light, lower it down, put a gel on the over it if they need to change the tone slightly. They're there, yeah, putting the set together, basically. It sounds like a huge setup, I can see. Then you have, so just to be clear, so the digital, are they actually, they are the organizing the images that they come off the sh um, at the, at the shot. Are they actually doing anything else with the images as well? Or do you have a... So they'll put that? a grade on, they can put a grade on them so that their files are coming out of the camera raw, that they're just, yeah, putting a grade on them so that when the client sees them, they'll, they're seeing them closer to how yeah. they'll be, just obviously not retouched. That makes sense. Okay. Being so generous in, in sharing in such detail, how one does that efficiently, that's, that's such a huge operation. But, so what sort of... I mean, I'm imagining what has to do that, not just to be efficient in terms of time, but also in terms of how much it's going to cost. So what would the sort of costs be of a shoot like that ballpark, not that particular one in general, or what would, would the cost be to produce that? Well, how much was that? The, well, top line, I actually don't know. I can show you one where I do know there's a m bit more paired back. Yeah, absolutely. You would obviously have just want, don't want anything that's going to compromise you, but I'm mindful that I would know, shoot probably would have cost over a hundred thousand pounds. Okay. I'm mindful that you did your first three months of uh, placement where you were working for free. Not many people can afford to do that. that and no. a bit of long live you as well. I'm very fortunate in the fact that I lived an hour out of London. I'm very fortunate that my mum was happy to drive me to the station to catch the train every morning. The internship was unpaid, but they did actually agree to cover my travel. So I wasn't losing money. But yeah, I was commuting from Dorking, which is Surrey, to Crouch End, which is North London. Um, and then at the weekends, I had a job that I, which paid me. Uh, so I had some money coming in. But 100%, it was, I had burnout. It was exhausting. I worked seven days a week for three months and it was hard. Uh, yeah. Yeah. A lot of us can empathize with that sort of getting, getting started. It, is, it isn't easy, but everything you've described right from the years that you've spent building up a portfolio with a photographer who may be shooting, doing tests and so on with other people who are doing tests is a massive investment. And then to get to the end where you actually you win all of these huge shoots, what sort of rates would the assistance be on? That's one step, isn't it? What sort of rate, uh, rates would you be looking to pay for your digi-op? And, and, what, and what sort of thing is the photographer going to walk away with? Both. So your lighting assistant, I'd say a, a standard rate for a lighting assistant, for a second lighting assistant, will probably be about £350 per day. If you're a first lighting assistant, you can go from 450 to 600 a digiops probably being paid like between 500 and 600. But also if you're a digiop and you have capture one on your laptop and you can use your laptop, you can rent out your laptop for another 50 quid a day. And if you, like, if you want to be an assistant, it's a good way to earn money quickly, but be like, learn capture one, learn lighting setups, know be technical and know all about it so that you become like so useful to a photographer. If they know that you've got it covered and they don't have to worry about you, they'll use you all the time. Like they photographers like to use people that they trust, that they know that they have got it, like they're safe hands. And, you know, my partner's a photographer and for 10 years he assisted and basically worked like between three and five days a week. So we get to go on like big trips like he's traveled the globe he's been to america to shoot and i think the bahamas and those that those travel shoots are 10 plus days and you get paid for the day that you travel there because you can't work so you're technically 
you be losing money. There's a down day, but you get paid because you're away. Yep, yep. The life of an assistant, I remember it well. It's yeah. hard. It's obviously hard. I mean, you've got to be personable. You've got to get on with the photography. You've got to carry everything and you've got to be on it. But if if you're good, then, yeah, photographers use it all the time. I used to love it. I used to love it. I'm, but I I did, in retrospect, I realise now that, that I did what Jude Amponster suggested. And I, I had one photographer that I wanted to to work with and sit right from being, right from studying. And I just loved his work and when she got to meet him and I, said, I still assist him to this day Astonishing. when it yes when when steve pike comes back to the uk i, I would still be there if he if he needs me so yeah i yes interesting i wonder how many people listening to this have thought about it as a career as an assistant because i never thought of it as a full-time career for me it was just a, it really was a stepping stone i was only doing it for long but it's also a really good stepping stone because you're earning money while you're doing it. You're building relationships with photographers, but with clients. If the photographer's getting a repeat booking from a client and the photographer's rebooking you, like you're also a repeat booking. Like the client begins to like to work with you. Like we do, we've I've worked on brands before who go, oh, we really want to shoot with this photographer. Is their assistant available too? And it's, yeah, I'll, I'll check. Or people like a team that they trust. It's like a safe pair of hands. When you're spending money on huge amounts of money on budgets to make a shoot happen, you obviously want to make sure it's going to go well. Amazing. So you said you had another job you were going to show us. Yes. So this was just a studio shoot, and I've produced this one fully myself. Oh, perfect. That's That was the final. But this was the brief. So the image that I just showed you is a, a, the final output from um, a shoot that we did for Badoo, which is a dating app. Um, this is the document that we had, again, for pre-production. That This was the brief that they had. They wanted catch, uh, they wanted candid, joyful and authentic portraits. We cast real couples and it was going to be shot in a studio because they were redesigning the, they were redesigning the app just because I think it's, it had been around for a while, but they wanted to rebrand to be more in line with the modern market. And the brand itself, it, they knew that their market was like the 30 plus year olds and their secondary audience was their younger market, like the early 20s. So the mandatories for the campaign was six to eight talents. So they were, we cast four different couples. The usage was all media worldwide except broadcast for five years. They wanted 35 to 45 images. The images had to be 300 DPI. And then, yeah, they wanted authentic and relaxed portraits showing individuals and couples representing both audience targets, older millennials and Gen Z. That's, that's amazing. Could you, could you just, uh, this is, I know this is just old hat to you now. The people in the room, this is brand new. All, what can you explain? All media worldwide broadcast five years. What does that mean? And um, so all media, it can go everywhere on socials, online, on your website, PR, newsletters, um, leaflets, billboards, like buses, everywhere. Um, worldwide. And so every contract would have that in. So the models would have that in. Yeah. Top, so yeah. the photographer so wide. This is probably, this is like one of the biggest usages you can have. So. This is all media worldwide, excluding broadcast, which ah, right. means TV, basically, for five years. So every shoot that we have, they'll have a usage. Normally, it'll be one year UK out of home um, or three months social media and website. And you quote for usage based on what those, their terms are. Gotcha. Um, and that would be a big part of your job as an agent, right? A hundred percent is is negotiating those fees, and uh, uh, the same with the model agents. They negotiate the models' fees, whereas the models, the face of the company, the photographer has created that image, and after five years, Badu won't be allowed to use these images anymore unless they decide to pay the models an additional fee and the photographer. Thank you. That's okay. They wanted to choose Vicky Grout. Um, this was an example of Vicky's work. And um, this was, we knew we wanted to shoot in a studio, 
and the studio because the brief we had two different types of coloramas and then they wanted some more aesthetic like real life shots so we found a big studio where we could have a white background a purple background and um, but then shoot outside this this studio had a rooftop and then also use a sofa so that the couples could sit and that we could get that authentic real life setting we cast real models so i spoke to a casting agent who put a shout out or oh. so not real models real couples yeah but to shout out to couples who would be happy to get involved and and be part of the campaign so these were our final four couples um, and then they we were going to shoot the couples individually and together and then there was going to be a shot where the two couples were together so again your shot list this, these were the must haves they wanted a portrait of each model the candid portraits of all couples, playful moments of the couples, close-ups, and then intimate portraits. It's amazing to see that. That's so, so explicit. Yeah. So when we built into the schedule on the day, we not obviously not everyone needed to arrive at once. So we had couple number one arrive at 7 a.m. They went into hair and makeup and styling. We were shooting them by nine when couple number two would arrive. When They'd go into hair, makeup, styling. And then we could rotate around the couples in the studio so that we could get all of these shots within time without having to like jump and run between. Talked about the different backdrops. They wanted a purple one. They wanted like a light blue. They really liked to use a gradient. They really liked the shadow idea. So the ones that are highlighted in red in the end were the ones that they selected. Just, yeah, more examples of the backgrounds, styling. So because Badu is a dating app and it's going out of home and you when you're a brand you can't advertise other brands so in styling you won't have it'll be unbranded clothing you won't have like a nike tick or an adidas symbol or you won't have anything else like that otherwise that company can get in touch and say we didn't give you permission to use our branding can you take it down so yeah these were the requirements for styling oh and that's basically it amazing and, and you produced all of that yourself yeah because it was just going to be a one-day studio shoot it, it's it made sense to keep it in-house rather than outsourcing because as a as a producer you obviously make as a if you're talking, an agent producer you obviously make a, you make money or the company makes money from the photographer's fee and usage but it also makes money from production and like production markups. Amazing. This is a daunting prospect to me, right? I would not, I, this is not, I could not organize that. I'm no surprise to you. Right. You through the whole process of trying to win it and then you win it and you're like, okay, I've actually got to do it now. Yes, quite. And how, how much of that you, do you think you could have done when you first started? Oh, none of it. None of it. When I studied photography, I photographed, I shot on an Amir RB67, so I only ever used natural light. The camera just about worked. I had to take it to be fixed all the time. I've still got it. And I do, yeah, I didn't use studio lights. I didn't really know how to use them. I could use a, a bounce. I could maybe put up, I, I couldn't do any of it. When I started at shoot and I did that first internship, she'd tell me to call, she'd t be very specific, call JJ Media Studios and book loft or find out which studios they've got available for this shoot. It's a food shoot, so we need a kitchen. Call Big Sky, see which food studios they have available. The photographer might have on their database can you call their assistants, see if they're available and put a first option on them? So I very much learned from her telling me specifically what to do as a pro to be a producer, but also we, she had a list, a client list, and it would also be my job to sit, call the agency and say, can I, can we come in for a portfolio meeting? And I'd be booking those in. So part of the job was, yeah, doing the admin, like being delegated to make those calls to the like different suppliers, like getting hair and makeup on hold, and then also booking the appointments at the ad agencies, and then we'd go together, show the portfolios, and talk about the work. 
So Mark C once told me when I was an assistant and he said, and I was struggling a bit and he said, John, he said, you should use the phone. The phone's a very seductive tool. How yeah. many of those, how many, and he said, you can be anyone on the phone, which I was like, what? coming from him as well, I thought it was amazing. And it changed the way that I approached things fundamentally and life got a lot easier. But right now I actually text people before I call them. Yeah. It seems rude just to ring someone up. Right. So, what are the mechanics of that for you? It has really changed. So obviously pre-COVID, everyone was in the office. People still had desk phones. So if I called an ad agency general number, spoke to the receptionist and then asked to speak to so-and-so in art buying, they would put me through. And then if they didn't answer, I'd then email. Or you'd get them on the phone and then you'd book in an appointment. It's obviously a lot of emailing and then maybe following up with the call if you don't hear back. But then after COVID, when everyone worked from home, like desk phones aren't really a thing anymore. Everyone uses their mobile. They might not have their mobile number on their signature. So you don't actually necessarily have that direct way to get in touch. So it is very much social media quite a lot, sending newsletters, just making sure that you're on their radar and sending them personal emails to say, oh, look, We'd love to come in with the portfolios. I've just started a new job. So an exciting part is being like, oh, I'm now at this agency. I'd love to come and show you the new roster I'm working with. And yeah, getting an appointments that way. So for those students that are graduating, would you advise them to try and get an agent straight away? No, I think with, I get emails from students who've just graduated with a first and they're like, can you represent me? And the honest answer is no, because you don't have enough work. A photo an agent doesn't just get you work. Basically, you have to work. It's a collaboration. So the photographers that I work with, I need, I know that they are also hustling themselves. We take on photographers who've got an established portfolio They've got a bun bunch of clients that they're already working with, so they're already making money. And then it's our job to open the, the next door, take the portfolio to the next level. So if you're graduating now and you want to be a photographer, like really work on that portfolio, build your client list. Yeah, just get those like regular commissions coming in like, and build on that so that in five or so years time, you can go, look, I've been working with this brand and I'm making money. I just want to be going to the next, I want to go to the next level. Amazing. So Jim, you've been so generous with all of this. I've, I have learned so much today and I, I'm thinking everyone in the room is going to be, this is going to be a lot to digest. What questions haven't I asked that I should have? What haven't you asked? I don't know, but I would, I think I'd say with the photographers to, yeah, hone their style, make sure. Don't waste money on getting a printed portfolio unless you're actually going to be going in and meeting people. But also while you're building your portfolio, just have an iPad or take it on your laptop. Just be, make sure what you're showing is relevant to the person that you're showing it to. We have photographers that we've taken on, on the roster and we're asking them to meet, but because they haven't had an agent before, they've just been going into meetings themselves and their laptop. Like for us, it's better. Because when we go into an agency and 20 people come along, if we have all the books out, then everyone can flick through and you can talk to them rather than yeah, being like hunched over a laptop. That's interesting. Yeah, that's the dark arts, isn't it? The tricks that one learns. Yeah, I've, I've, still, I've still got five folios. <laughs> Imogen, that's been, you've been super generous. Uh, there's so much for us to dig around in there. Our students are going to be making online presences this year. I, I know that um, it would be incredibly valuable were you to be able to have a look at some of them and uh, give them some feedback. Um, would you be able to do that? Yeah, of course. Amazing. And for the person in the room who has realized that they are also imaging more and they, they don't want to be a photographer, but they want to be involved in all the fun things associated with photography. Could you set us a brief? Yes. Do I need to do that now or can I think later? You can think later. Cool, perfect. <laughs> and also, like for that person, speak to your peers. There's someone next to you who's got an idea for a photo shoot that doesn't know how to make it happen. Why don't you collaborate and you be their producer? Amazing. Okay. So Imogen, how can we get hold of you? Where are you in the world? You can find me on LinkedIn under Imogen Wall. And I'm also at Probation Agency. So if you look at www.
www.probationagency.com. You will see me and the photographers that I'm currently working with. Amazing. Thanks, Imogen. You're welcome. Thank you.